All right, well, let's get going. Uh, good morning, everyone, to Drupal North, day two. Um, thanks for waking up early, coming out on a Saturday morning for a little Drupal. Let's see if this thing works. Hello, my name is Crispin Bailey. I'm the Director of Design and UX at Kalamuna. I'm responsible for design and content strategy practice uh, there. I also manage the design and content team and oversee Kalamuna's discovery and design phases for our larger client projects. I'm really excited to be here today uh, talking about something I really love, which is web design. Um, but first I want to give you a little context and tell you how I got here. Um, I initially started out as a print designer in the early 90s, working for my dad, uh, but I couldn't stand how fussy and stressful print was, so um, what I really wanted to get into was interaction design. Um, and thanks to an NDP-sponsored job training program back then, we used to have those kind of things, so I was able to take a multimedia production course, and not long after got my first job as a web designer in 1996, so that tells you how old I am. Uh, back then, the notion of a CMS was uh, much less an open source CMS was a bit of a foreign concept. Um, I used to design in Photoshop and painstakingly build websites um, page by page using tables with all these one by one pixel spacer GIFs, you know, holding the pages together. It was good times. Um, but then sometime around 2005, I learned about this thing called Drupal. And for me, the clouds opened up and rainbows appeared and I saw the future. This was version Drupal 4.6. Uh, these were exciting times. We made blogs, we made websites anyone could use, even our clients. Um, but uh, I, I pulled up together a few uh, pictures of Drupal 4.6 sites. This was, there's a website that actually features some of the greatest Drupal websites of the day. Um, and they're not exactly works of art, but they were, again, groundbreaking at the time. So I could see that there was potential. Um, and then in 2007, Drupal 5 came out, and it was like a whole new era. So I got really excited, and I got totally caught up in the Drupal movement. Um, it was a small community back then, as it is now, but it was even smaller. Uh, there weren't many designers doing Drupal, um, but um, my wife and I, who's also a designer, we were, and we were asked if uh, we would design the t-shirts for Drupal Camp TO in 2007. Uh, and then again in 2008, and some of you may rem might remember that, and those t-shirts, I still see some of them around. Um, by that point, I was an associate director at Simpatico MSN, uh, working with the ad operations team, working really hard to put banner ads on Nokia and Samsung smart uh, cell phones. This was before the iPhone and smartphones. Um, but I was still doing web design uh, and building websites on the side uh, with my wife and partner, Patricia Rodriguez, she's here today. And we built all of our sites using Drupal. Um, then for various reasons we decided to leave Toronto, we moved down to Mexico and you know six months turned into a lot longer and then we spent the next five years kind of bouncing around um, Mexico and, and Canada, um, freelancing, designing iPhone apps, trying to launch a couple startups that eventually failed um, and we returned to Toronto in 2013. At that point I reconnected with the Drupal uh, community here. We did the branding of the website for Drupal Camp TO 2013. And I also designed the Doug Teal logo around that time. So that's my connection to Drupal. Um, so that ended up getting me a job at Therefore Interactive, um, where I worked for a couple years as a digital producer, before I was lured away by Andrew at Kalamuna, and uh, the chance to work for a Bay Area company. So that brings me to Kalamuna. We're a digital agency uh, that partners with socially impactful institutions, associations, agencies, and organizations to help solve today's most pressing problems using strategy, design, and technology, and a lot of Drupal, uh, to empower them to accomplish their missions. Uh, we're a distributed team with half the company working remotely. Uh, I'm still based here in Toronto. Um, our headquarters is in downtown Oakland, California, the Bay Area, a hotbed of West Coast activism, education, and innovation. Um, the kind of work we do is uh, largely working with universities and research institutes, um, nonprofits, government agencies, utilities, and progressive companies in the media and health sectors. So, large, by and large, we use Drupal for good. 
So I just wanted to get a quick show of hands, um, get you kind of moving a little bit this morning. How many people in the room are developers? Can you put up your hands? Developers? Okay, most of you. All right. How many designers are in the room? Okay, that's mattering. Okay. And how many project managers? Okay, good diverse crowd. Any product owners or clients? All right, cool. Any content people? Yay. Oh, wow, some people put their hands up more than once. Good. Many hats. Uh, I'm a designer. I'm not a developer, full disclosure. Uh, I can kind of hack around a little bit, but I do not pretend to be a coder. Um, but as a designer, I'm always trying to solve problems, and I like to follow process. You may have heard designers love process. Um, at Kalamuna, we also enjoy processes and improving them, um, and being creative and giving back to the community. So that's why I'm here talking today. Um, I'm going to be uh, speaking about how we fix one of the biggest problems with uh, the old web design process. Um, I don't know how many of you have been around long enough to remember this, but you used to hear this quite often. All Drupal sites look the same. Usually Snickers coming from the Flash designers at the time. Um, and it was for a good reason. I have my theories, but um, one is because uh, the sites were usually designed by the same person who was going to build it. So you know, you know that you were aware of the Drupal limitations, the Drupalisms. Um, he would start with a basic Drupal distribution, right, in a common base theme, Garland, uh, and use contrib modules out of the box. Um, so what, what does this mean, right? It means that essentially the websites were being designed backwards. The solution was dictating the design many times. So, you know, this is what a typical project workflow would look like, and I was, I, I was a part of this. Um, so I know I'm not proud of it, but this is how, this is the way we used to do it, right? Figure out what the client wants. They don't want they want a website. We got Drupal, no problem. Install the Drupal distribution. You know, usually the base one uh, that would do about 80% of what you needed it to do, and then you you know install a few contrib modules to do the rest, like views. Um, you start building the site, of course, without any real content. And you spend the next three to four weeks just hacking the theme, trying to make it not look like Drupal, but it still looks like Drupal because you're not really doing much except putting a little bit of paint and varnish on it. Eventually, you get the content into the site, right? Hopefully, um, client, got it? Keep writing. Uh, spend the next two weeks tweaking things because now you've got content in it, so you've got to like start adjusting everything to actually make it fit and work. And then finally, you'll launch the site. And hopefully it doesn't look something like this, but it might. <laughs> Excuse me, here's your Drupal website, enjoy. But it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, there is a more ideal project workflow to designing a, a beautiful web experience. Um, this is my little attempt at a hand-drawn uh, effort to kind of lay it out <laughs> nice and simply, right? On the far left, you have the research and design phase where you're actually you know, like, like full blue sky, what should this do, what should it be? Um, and then you're working with your client collaboratively. They give you the thumbs up, yeah, I love it, this, let's go with it. And then you want to prototype it. And, and this is a, a big part of my talk today is about this, the importance of this prototyping because if you prototype things, then you can test things. And that's when you can like blow them up and break them and realize what doesn't work and fix it before you implement it. Okay, so you've done your prototyping, you've done your testing, you know what you're gonna do now. Just build it, build it really efficiently, once, ideally. Um, then, get your content in, and you've thought this all through, because hopefully the content's been coming along the whole time, you've been using some of that in your prototyping. And you migrate your site, you might up to the server, and you launch with great fanfare, yay. So that's the dream, right? Kalamuna, we do things uh, very similarly. We have a more slick diagram to, de to depict it, uh, but it's basically the same approach, right? We start with discovery. We're asking a lot of questions. We're trying to uncover the reasons why we're even building this thing, who we're building it for, what are the business objectives, what are the end user goals, those sort of things. Then we move into designing and coding, testing, right? And eventually launching and support because the website is never done. 
So where does prototyping fit in right in that juicy middle part? And there should be a lot of it, right? Um, and this is the part of the process I want to focus on today, uh, prototyping and testing and the benefits of that. So why prototype? Um, maybe you haven't heard that this is a great thing to add to your process, so I'm going to just go over some of the basics. Uh, first, you want to test your designs before you spend time and effort implementing. It's a lot easier to fix things when they're not as precious and when you're not actually monkeying around with the back end and with the CMS. It allows you to find usability issues and fix them at a much lower cost effectively for that reason. And finally, you get client feedback and buy-in before things get complicated and, and, and costly to change. So three really good reasons to implement prototyping into your process. Um, when does it make sense? Um, I would say almost every project, but in particular if you're working on a large complex web project that need to minimize risk, because again it could be very expensive to make changes later on. Um, it allows you to test your designs before committing to development, so that's like that's really the key. Uh, you can use static content files. Um, to eliminate the reliance on CMS setup, right? So if you if you have a good prototyping framework, you don't need to have a CMS and you don't need to hand code everything. There are ways, and I'll show you a little bit later how to do that. Um, it also allows you to explore design ideas without impacting the CMS site build. In fact, those two things can be happening at the same time in parallel. And it's also really great on big projects with tight timelines. Why? Because your front-end UX and UI work can happen ahead of the implementation, uh, if, especially if you're in an agile or, or, or a lean UX kind of uh, workflow. Um, you can be innovating and designing things and testing them before you, the, uh, one sprint ahead of the dev team. Um, also, you, this will encourage tighter collaboration between your front-end and back-end developers because you're going to be having those conversations earlier on in the process about how you should be naming things, how you should, what your namespaces are going to look like, uh, and working out and thinking through a little bit more how you want the CMS to be built and, and effectively designed. What about small projects? I mean, is this really just for big enterprise size projects? No, absolutely not. Um, you might not need a CMS at all. If you're just building a small site, you can just go static and build a completely static website. Um, this will allow you to build your site or one page or layout at a time. Use simple markdown files to edit content. It's not that hard to learn. Um, and you can leverage popular HTML, or CSS, JS frameworks like Bootstrap or Foundation um, to get a lot of those co uh, common components out of the box. Who should prototype? Well, everyone. Um, you can prototype your designs, of course. But you can also prototype your content. Um, you can prototype your business model. Again, it's just so much quicker to do it earlier on before you're m monkeying around with your CMS. Um, and you can test and validate your concepts earlier on and with real people and uh, you know, validate all those assumptions. Uh, but back to process and systems. Uh, designers love systems too. Uh, so, if you haven't uh, seen any talks uh, already about this whole notion uh, of prototyping and designing with components in mind, um, there's this principle called atomic design principle, it's Brad, coined by Brad Frost, whereby you have uh, this, this kind of old chemistry model where the smallest elements of a component are like the atoms. You can build up these atoms to form your molecules, like, a, like in this case, uh, a search uh, input tool or component. And then those molecules can be combined to form greater organisms like the header of your website. Um, so this is, this is the, the way a lot of modern design teams are going because it's just an, it, it, it was a bit radical as an idea, but uh, when you're getting into, again, these, these component-based architectures where you're having lots of little bits that you want to use uh, across not necessarily one website, perhaps multiple websites, or, or products, it just makes a lot of sense to think this stuff through this way. And then you use these components, right, to build your web page. You combine your components with your layouts and your content, and boom, magic, you have a web page. So, 
This is the idea. There have been uh, a number of people who have been innovating on these kind of the concepts over the last few years. Um, but where we were, were were tripped up was that a lot of the time um, you had to you would basically build your prototype and then you 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 design and, and code up all your components. But then you'd have to actually redo a lot of this stuff uh, to make it work in Drupal. And it seemed wasteful because you weren't able to reuse the code uh, that was powering your prototype and your, and your style guides in your Drupal theme. So we sought to fix that. Um, and we came up with this, this was the dream, where we would have the, the system to simplify and streamline the process of going from our design files to working code. So as to, when we're designing and we're not even, you know, not into code at all yet, we're doing, we're, you know, coming up with things like style tiles and, and you know, a few mock-ups or comps. Uh, and the idea would be to, you know, take those elements and build them into a style guide in code, HTML and CSS, um, that you can test and look at in the browser. And then that code that's, in the, that's powering the style guide is also powering your, combining with your layouts um, to form your Drupal theme templates. So this was the idea, was to have reusable code, uh, the, you know, our twig templates, and our CSS and our SAS files all being used to power not just the style guide and our prototypes, but also our Drupal sites. So to do that, we came up with a system we call Calistatic. And it's really a framework for prototyping and delivering uh, documentation in the form of a living style guide. Uh, so what is Calistatic? Well, as I mentioned, it's a prototyping framework for websites and web apps. It's a static site generator, so you can, like I said, design entire pages. You can build a whole website using it, page at a time. It's a living style guide generator with reusable code. A bridge builder between atomic design components and the Drupal theme layer, therefore. And it's a solution for modern web design and dev teams who are practicing the UX because once you start using this as a part of your methodology, you realize that there's going to be a lot more collaboration between your front end and your back end teams and your design teams. So who is Calistatic for? Well, as I mentioned earlier on, you know, it's for everyone, but um, the people who are looking to develop HTML prototypes and style guides can use it right out of the box, so to speak. Um, it's great for, for agencies who are collaborating with other shops, so you might be a design, more of a design-focused agency or you might be a, more of a dev shop, um, and this can be a way for two different agencies to work together more effectively. Um, it's for anyone who wants to share the style guide components, CSS and JS, with Drupal theme layer, as I mentioned before. Uh, for anyone who wants to decouple the front-end design system from the content, and there may be a number of reasons why you, you would do this. Um, we've been talking, I've been talking mostly about, you know, the economies of inefficiencies that you gain from using this for Drupal theme layer, but you can also use it for other legacy back-end systems. You may have old databases that you need to also support to pull in uh, legacy data, and you can have a, you can reuse um, the same components and layouts to have a seamless experience across multiple backends, but it still feels like the same website. And it allows you to build a large number of custom components in a short amount of time. Again, because you're thinking through things a little bit more efficiently, more differently, you're, you're breaking things down into their elements and then building them up in a very uh, logical, efficient way. So who is it for specifically? Um, well, it's really, gets the front-end developers excited, at least that's what I've noticed, um, and in our shop. Uh, Code-savvy designers, though, can definitely get in there, get their hands dirty. If you are not afraid of code, you can embrace this. Uh, Back-end devs who are working with front-end designer and developer might want to encourage this uh, as part of the workflow, uh, because it will, again, facilitate that collaboration. In-house teams, so maybe your product team, um, you can adopt this. It makes a lot of sense, again, as I mentioned earlier, if, you're, if you've got more than one product, or more than one website, and you're looking to reuse and have a central repository for your, your components. And of course, for agencies, it's great. And that's why we came up with it. Okay, so how does it help? Here's the compelling uh, kind of sales pitch. Prototyping in the browser, 
uh, is just miles ahead of prototyping with static files, flat files that aren't responsive. We live in a re responsive age. People are using uh, smartphones, tablets, laptops, desktops, you name it. So you want to get into the browser as quickly as possible and validate how your, how your designs are going to look and behave. It allows you to design and test pages and components before site building, so I keep hammering this home, because uh, doing this before implementation starts and staying a, one step ahead of the implementation um, development is, is really efficient. And having a living style guide provides you with both documentation and reusable code that can be shared with Drupal theme files and static site pages. Um, and finally, uh, why Calistatic is special is because it actually supports Drupal 7 as well as Drupal 8, uh, thanks to Twig support that we built. Um, we use this uh, module called Twigshim, which allows us to use Twig templates for Drupal 7 sites. And this will make migrating to Drupal 8 that much easier later on. All right, so time for a little case study. I've been talking a lot about this. Let's see it in action. First of all, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, one of our a project we did for a client. They're a genetic testing lab based in La Jolla, California. Uh, they needed a single website that spoke to both doctors and patients, so we had an interesting challenge there. Um, they rebranded the entire company and the product line during the project, which normally would make designers and developers pull their hair out, but we actually were able to take it in stride. Um, the content was mostly ready when the project started. They had a few pages. Um, and they had planned to unveil the website at the company's annual sales meeting, uh, which was like less than three months away. So it was a very tight timeline. Now this, uh, also to give a little bit of context, this was a Drupal 7 project. This was, um, we started it uh, about a year and a half ago, so it was before Drupal 8 was really mature and ready. Um, but we were thinking about Drupal 8 already and where we wanted to go with this. So it was a perfect case study for this and use case for this, um, for this framework. All right, so here's kind of what it looks like on desktop and uh, smartphones now. Uh, but we're going to jump out and see this in real life here. Let's see if I can get this thing to work. Um, Escape. Yes, I do. Oh, geez. Now I can't see what I'm doing. Uh, uh, where's my mouse? Hold on. Is it over there? Uh, up, 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 down. down. I cannot down. see where it is. Stop. That's the last tab. You want the last or next to last? I want the the second tab. Okay, go to the left a bit. Left. <laughs> okay. No. Oh, oh. Down. 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 Right. Right. Down a bit. Down a bit. Up a bit. There. There. No, that's not the one. Oh, wait. This way. This way. This way. This way. Right. Yeah. There. Yeah. All right. Now I want the green dot. Oh, jeez. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Where is it? There it is. Oh. Yeah. I'm going. Almost there. Almost there. A little bit more. Oh, too far. Yeah. 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 A little bit more. What? Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. This is. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Okay, so this is actually. Um, an Envision prototype. So I wanted to show you this first because before we got into code, we do like to prototype even earlier in the process using static mockups. Um, so we would normally start. With, we'll normally start with a uh, like an interactive uh, wireframe prototype. But the client wants to see comps. They want to see what it's going to look like. So we actually mock up a few pages, get them in Envision, and allow you know allow people to click around. Now here's where it's going to get. Crazy again. How am I going to do this? I'll do you use the keyboard here, command, and then the number of the tab you want to go to. Well, I wanted to click around on this oh, thing. Oh, sorry. Okay, never mind. You know what I'm going to do? Hold on. I'm going to mirror my displays. Ha! Where's arrangement? Mirror displays. Now, where to go? 
gather windows. Okay. The mirroring displays and I've lost my thing completely. Okay, bring it back. Hey! Alright, now I see what you see. Okay. So this is an Envision prototype. It's a flat file. It looks like a comp, but it's clickable. So this is just, I just want to give you a quick little tour and show you how, you know, we came up with the, a few key pages um, and everything on this site uh, was kind of thought through with this component design model, right? So these are not interactive elements, uh, but some things are. So let's click around. Here's a product page. Uh, it has various tabs. You know, we have the carousel all these little different elements, right? So, that was fine. We got sign off and approval from the client. Yes, we love it, let's go, let's go. So I'm like, okay, let's do this. Um, let's think this through in terms of a, a breaking it down into individual components in our style guide, and in, in, but let's prototype the pages as well. So this page is the actual, this is a calisthenic pro, uh, prototype page. Um, this is also, I should all note that it doesn't look like the previous one because the site has evolved since where you're, you're, uh, where you're on now. So you can see they've added some lovely video effects. Um, this is all interactive, right? So these are the actual components. Uh, we've got a nice little rising little parallax effect on the, on the flowers there and various parts of the site. Now, this is just one page, so I'm not going to click all the way through. But I do want to show it you uh, how the elements here are also in our style guide. So I'll open this up. So from a brand perspective, you know, we're making sure we've got all the brand colors that are used throughout the site. And we've got our UI components. So we have things like breadcrumbs, uh, buttons, and these are these are actually interactive. And one of the key things uh, for this, this style guide is that we actually, you can get the markup on it. So when I was mentioning that you're getting documentation as well, um, you can click this little link here, and you can see the markup for that component. Right, and there's your little, little twig variables in there. And we have some more fancy ones. Let's see, let's close this up. Um, charts. So we can even do things like uh, interactive charts. So, and when I say interactive, I wanted to show this bit. Uh, let's get out of the out of the green mode here for a second. Uh, oh well, that's going to show it. This is a responsive graph, right? So every component that we have here, including our tables, we have our responsive tables is documented in the style guide. Okay. Go back to full screen. And then here's the actual site. Now, all of these components, and you can see, I wanted to actually, I, I noticed something last night when I was getting ready for, the, for this presentation. See how this, uh, this point of differentiation here, there's an image with a round circle. It's a beautiful circle, full circle. But in our prototype page in Calistatic, I noticed that it was being cut off. And just to prove the point that we're sharing the same code between our living style guide and our, and our prototype pages, when I was looking, at, when I confirmed here, I went to the, uh, I think it's under the content, um, no, it's not the content one, or is it, I think it might be UI, where is that circle, no, it's not here, one of these tabs, charts, navigation, media, there it is. So I tried fussing around with this a little bit to try and fix it for today's demo, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to go with this. This is actually proving that there's a connection between the style guide and the prototype page, but it's reusing the same code. Uh, fortunately, this hasn't made it up to production yet. It's not on the live site. So there's another reason why this is a compelling uh, element to add to your workflow, because you can spot these issues before they go live. Of course, we have dev staging and live environments so we can test these things beforehand um, but there's just another example
Okay, back to the deck. And I'm not even gonna try to do the presenter mode yet for this thing. Stick the screen mirror. Okay, so that was progenity.com. Drupal 7 site. Uh, we did user testing, we did the HTML prototyping, we saw that. Uh, we saw the living style guide. Uh, and then site building. So the interesting thing about this website, um, because we were using components to define every single element on the page, we only used one content type to build the entire site. It was called a page. And every page was basically built up using these different components. So you can see on this, we've got down the left hand side a bunch of tabs. Uh, so in this, in this panel you can define the hero part of the site. Um, Define the accent color, load a, an accent image, upload a logo for the product if necessary. If you don't fill out any of those things, it doesn't display them. It's simple. The next tab is the content. And again, for our clients, they were like, wow, this is like blowing our minds. This is like so much easier than any other Drupal website I've ever used before. I can build the page just the way I want it. So they would just add components, add a list, add a bar graph add a teaser, whatever they needed to add to a page to build it up. And it was, and it was all uh, contextually aware of what was being added to the page in order to display things uh, the way the client expected them to, to turn out. Uh, so here's an example of a basic component. We could have a button or a footnote or a block of text or a four up kind of feature uh, type thing. So the client was delighted. They had uh, a very simple editing and website management ex uh, experience. We were really delighted because we could manage the whole front end and all the code and all the look and feel without getting into uh, monkeying around with the CMS and having to come up with new content types and uh, all sorts of things. And then even for their product tabs. Uh, so that whole site that I showed you, which had all these different pages, um, is actually just one content type. Okay, so wrap it up some, uh, for the tech folks, techie folks in the audience, we do have some exciting features that may appeal to you with Calistatic. What does it give you? Um, first of all, it's easy to install. Node is the only language dependency. Can you get the living customizable style guide and component library? We, you know, fancied it up for this client to make it look pretty and to match their brand. Um, and you can do the same for your clients. They love it. Uh, it's got the CI build chain, so locally or remotely via Circle and Travis. Um, it's styling framework agnostic, so we've done now projects with Bootstrap and Foundation as a kind of underlying component uh, architecture, but you can roll your own as well. Uh, and as I mentioned, full Drupal integration with a calistatic.module, and this gives you a few useful settings um, right out of the box. And you get production-ready code. As I mentioned, you can use this for standalone sites. The Kalamuna website outside of the blog is built in Calistatic. We only have like less than a dozen pages. We don't need all the CMS for that. And we've uh, actually spent a lot of time uh, writing up documentation. So if you go to the GitHub project, you'll find lots of material, lots of examples. Um, flexibility is included. Uh, so it favors convention over configuration. There's little to no configuration required. Uh, you can use Twig. As we mentioned earlier, we were ex really excited to get Twig into it. Um, but you can use any other uh, templating language using JS transformers. So it supports SAS, Markdown, etc. Uh, you can do easy content modeling uh, with YAML and or JSON. Uh, it can integrate with external JSON content sources. So this is the other thing, as I was mentioning earlier, you don't have to use it with Drupal. Uh, you can have markdown files, but you could also pull in a, a feed from any other content source that can spit at JSON. So this might be prismic.io. Uh, or gather content. If you're using that to stage your content with your client before, uh, get, before the CMS has been built and is ready. Uh, or you can use Drupal, like a headless version. Um, it doesn't have to be used for the Drupal theme layer. You can actually have a headless site. So a few additional features. Uh, easy JS concatenation and compression. Ooh. Built-in web, ser web server, though this is cool, uh, because it supports, uh, it's got browser sync built in. Um, it supports live reload uh, for simultaneous cross-device testing, and I'll show you in a, in a minute how that works. Uh, cache busting. Now, I don't even know what that means, but Rob Loach put this in my slide, so 
Some of you might. Cool. Yeah. Um, and supports collections for content loops. Again, just to be able to quickly generate prototypes, uh, you know, render tables and stuff like that. Um, dependency management is built in as well, so it'll pull in node library files into the project without having to reference them. And to give you a taste of what it's like, we've got a little demo. And I'm not going to do a live demo. I'm going to play a video. And I really hope the audio works, otherwise I'm going to have to talk along with this. My name is Rob Bush. No. Nope. Today we're going to be talking about the Calisthenics. Can you guys hear this? This is a simple project in order to give it a good example of what the is coming. That's not the audio. <laughs> it sounds great though. Should we try again? It's bare bones. Nope. How sound, please? Should have warned you, shouldn't I? Is there another jack I should plug in? One more time. No? No audio. Okay, so this is a little example. I'll just walk you through it. Rob's showing you the cat is gonna go to the, the uh, showing you the different kind of where the files are that you would want to manipulate, in particular in the source directory. So he's gonna open that up. This is a boilerplate project, so just a really simple example of uh, Calistatic. It's a hello world page. Uh, just got a couple pages, a little bit of content on it, just to prove the point. Uh, you can see it's got a title, it's got some elements, now he's going to go into the source directory. And show you there's an index markdown file, and a resources markdown file, and, some, and a directory of layouts. So he's going to open the index markdown file, and you can see it's got a few elements, which we saw on the page a moment ago and we're going to edit this file. All right, so you can see where it's defining the layout, html.twig. It's got a title, hello world, and a description. And then below that, those are kind of like, that's like the metadata. Then below that, there's a little bit of actual markdown for the page itself. So Rob's just going to add a little awesome sauce to this file. It's going to save it. And then he's going to, you can just see that other tab just flashed. And there it says awesome sauce in the page now. Yeah. So that was just a really quick update. And he's going to go back. And while he's actually uh, talking in the background, he's making a, he's going to make another edit. So I'm actually just pointing out here's the layout stuff. HTML.twig file that's building that page. It's in the layouts file, just a single file here. So there you can see it's basically, it looks like HTML, but it's got some twig references right in it, right? So there's the title that it was pulling in. Yeah, title, easy edits. There's the title reference in the markdown file. And as I was saying earlier, it, doesn't, it can be a markdown file, but it can also pull in JSON. Again, you just really have to cross-reference the right fi file type. Put in your and away you go. All right, that was the end of my spectacular multimedia demo. Let's get into this. All right, so as I mentioned, we do have this boilerplate project up on GitHub. Uh, I'll be putting these uh, slides up on the Drupal North website after the presentation today, so you can download it and play with it yourself. Um, another point to point, another thing to point out that Calistatic is free as in speech, not as in beer. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that means, uh, beer is, is free if I give it to you, but you can't really do anything except drink it. Um, you can't modify it. It's like, so like an example would be like a Flash plugin. Uh, but Calistatic is free as in open source. So we've built it using open source libraries and packages, and in turn have made the project open source. So please feel free to go on GitHub, 
look it up, find it, download it, play with it, um, contribute back to it. We'd love to hear how you're using it and how you think it can be better. There, uh, you'll see on the right there, there are a number of other projects that we've also open sourced that make and extend, uh, make it even more powerful and extend it. So in there, there's like the calstatic.module, so you'll need this for Drupal. Uh, we have some bootstrap components, uh, the twig filters, things like that, and the boilerplate. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention these fine people who are actually the contributors and the architects behind Calistatic. Rob Loach is our director of uh, technology. Uh, Derek Giraffe, senior architect. Diego de Menol Bueno, our uh, senior designer. Uh, Josh Walker, who's no longer with us, but still contributing to the project. And our fearless leader, Andrew Mounds. And that's it, that's Calistatic, everyone. So I wanted to thank you all so much for uh, coming out this morning. And if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. If they're too technical, I'll field them uh, to either Andrew, who's in the audience now, or take your questions and get back to you. Yeah, question at the back. Uh, okay, you want to ask another question, I'll open it. All right. Other questions? All right. Yes. Frontend is going uh, ahead of the information architecture. Uh, how is the backend experience for the events? So the question was, if the front end is being designed and developed ahead of the information architecture, how is the back end for the admins, how's that experience being handled? So when I was referring earlier to, um, to the ability for the front end team to be working ahead of the, of the back end team, we, we have already gone through an exercise of defining information architecture, so maybe I didn't um, make that clear enough, that the information architecture, which includes you know, your content types, your taxonomy, your site map, uh, even your, your layouts, right, like your wireframes, all inform that information architecture. So we've already got a very good understanding of what, the, what we need to build in the CMS. Uh, but the difference is the coding of the front end can happen ahead of the implementation on the back end. So that those static prototypes that are, that are just a, really a look and feel with some dummy content in them, or even real content, are, can still be used to validate that content model and that, that information architecture before we commit to building it in Drupal or in the CMS. So that's the principle. So it's not that it's... Uh, it's actually being considered more thoroughly uh, because we're not going to be building out the back end, the CMS, and making assumptions about how it should be organized before validating that that's exactly the design we want to build. Does that answer your question? Yeah, mostly. Uh, I mean, it, it, as you said, you've got the information architecture going. I guess I'm just thinking um, if you haven't actually prototyped the back end as well, but, which you might, but it's not clear to me from what you're saying then there's no, uh, the admins haven't tested the back end. Right, so again, the question is like, what about the back end? Do you prototype the back end to ensure that that experience will be good for the admins or the content editors or, or so yeah. on and so forth? Yeah, that's a really, really, really good point, and I'm glad you brought it up because we have had some challenges with that where, you know, it's very easy, I think, for us to get as, as you know, cutting edge innovative developers to get excited about a new paradigm or a new way of building the back end. And then we give it to the client and say, okay, here's your interface. And you know, we did have one project where that was a disaster. And we had to re-architect the back end experience to make it easier for them to build their pages. Um, so it is an important consideration, so thank you for bringing that up. It's not uh, something that Calistatic really has anything to do with but it is something that the backend team should be thinking about because the user experience is not just for the end user on the front end, it is also for the people managing the content. Got a question, sir? Uh, yeah, it's kind of, kind of related. Um, how, how well does Calistatic handle assistive tech? If I'm coming in with a screen reader, does it navigate well through it or, or not? So the question was, how well does Calistatic handle assistive technology like screen readers? Um, and when you say Calistatic, do you mean the, the code that gets spit out and is rendering your page, or do you mean like the project files and whatnot? If, if someone with low vision 
or cognitive impairment needs to use a screen reader yeah. and wants to do some prototyping or wants to look at the prototype that's been built and then go and code from it. How easily can you navigate through? So you're not necessarily trying to do creative work, but you're trying to look at content that other people have manipulated. Okay, so again, the, to clarify that we're, we're asking, he's, a, he's asking about how good is, is Calistatic as a prototyping and style guiding tool for people using assistive technology. Yeah. Fantastic question, and that is something that we have been made even more cognizant of as an important element to, uh, to work on on our product because we just started working with the American Foundation for the Blind. We're doing the design in the front end, and they're going to be implementing the code in back end using Drupal. So I can't say that right now it's fantastic, but by the end of this project it will be because we're going to be working with blind developers and they're going to be taking the calistatic code to build their front end. I asked that I work for CNIB here in Toronto. Okay. So similar problem. Now what kind of time scale are you talking about with AFB? When when do you think the tools are going to be open? Uh, well we're hoping to put something in their hands by the end of September. That's yeah, so in the next uh, month and a half or so. Yeah. And again, everything we do will be updating uh, the repo, so it's just going to get better and better. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for asking. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, like many other agencies here, we are hiring, looking in particular for uh, Drupal developers and uh, front-end developers. So if this is the kind of stuff that you're excited about, please either check out our website, uh, look for the jobs page, or come look for uh, come up and chat with me at any point during the conference. So enjoy the rest of your day.